What's the state of the art, let's say, let's put it this way, in decision making right now? What are the latest uh, news about that <coughs> in research? And what's the, so, you know, there's lots of things happening. The, the field is really bustling. People are doing lots of interesting stuff. There's lots of uh, interesting uh, ideas. <coughs> um, one of my favorite uh, results uh, of the last couple of years is uh, by Mike Norton, uh, who's now at Harvard. <coughs> and um, Mike has basically looked at the question of does, what's the relationship between money and happiness? So, of course, there's a lot, a lot of old research showing that basically money can't buy happiness. <coughs> but, of course, it's really bad to be poor. The poor are really miserable. But above a certain level of salary, and I'm not talking millions here, but above a relatively modest salary, people uh, don't get as much happiness from salary as they think they would. And the question is why? And there was a, an actress called, I think it was... Bo Derek or something. There was an actress a while ago that says, if you think money can't buy happiness, you just don't know where to go shopping. Wow. Uh, but, but Mike has basically asked the question of, yes, it does look like people who are, have more money are not necessarily more happy. Is it because they don't know how to spend their money? Mm. And what he's shown is that people that give money away are actually surprisingly more, more happy. And it, it has two kind of uh, interesting levels. One is that he showed that if people buy somebody else a cup of coffee or give some money to charity, they become happier for longer than if they spend the money on themselves. So donations and uh, things that are similar to that. Donation, inviting a friend for dinner, inviting a friend for coffee, doing it something for an anonymous person, even in small amounts, tend to have a relatively large effect on happiness. The other part of it, is they took teams at the, at the workplace and they gave some people a little bit more money. And they showed that if the company gave these people a bit more money, it was basically a loss. These people did not work harder for the company. But if they gave them a little bit of money to spend it on their team members and they spent it on their team members, now the returns for the companies were quite high. Why? Because now you created a people who are happier because they've spent money on other people and you created a better team. So I think it's really interesting by saying how do you think of ourselves, we're inherently social animals and money is usually thought of as something selfish. How do we create structures in which money is part of our social environment and how do we get that to get people to behave better or to behave in, in a more interesting way. So I really like those uh, those results. And the other thing that is happening uh, is, of course, people are going into the field and doing interesting experiments. Uh, most recently, there's been a couple of interesting studies on what's called name your own price. So this started, of course, there was this uh, band called Radiohead that allowed people to pay as much as they want. And then there was an interesting restaurant in England that during the recession told people, um, that they could pay as much as they want. And what they reported was that people paid a little less, but more people came to the restaurant and they made more money. So wow. there's been some more systematic effort to quantify that uh, recently, uh, showing some interesting results. So, you know, name, name your own price is basically about people being generous. It's about the fact that I understand that you're doing something for me as a favor, and now I'm willing to do something back for you. And it's very easy to see in food. I go to a restaurant, somebody serves me food, I know that they spend money on it. Now I feel my reciprocity engine is starting and I feel a need to pay them back for it in some way. But it turns out it can also work on digital goods. So there's an interesting website that sells uh, music and they sell an album for $5. But they also ask you if you want to give more than the $5. And every dollar you give above it, half of it goes to the artist and half of it goes to the website. And on average, people end up paying eight. Again, you know, really quite, quite nice. So this, this exploration of the generosity of people and the willingness to participate and to pay other people both financially and in time, I think is another kind of interesting direction. 
You know, I I really uh, enjoyed reading your uh, effort for payment uh, paper. Thank you. Um, I thought it was really interesting to see how th this kind of uh, relationships, you know, the, the favor, the money, um, so the, the way that the people are immersed in um, markets, you know, social market versus uh, money market. Yeah. So uh, my question is the following: Do you think that you know the study was made uh, with um, people who didn't know what they're going to do? Actually, they were brought there and they were were told that they were going to have to yeah. do something in exchange for uh, candy or money. Okay. Yeah. So the the kind of market they were in was suggested by the kind of payment they were offered. So my question is. Uh, when you have a company uh, that is already there, that already has a, a hierarchical structure, you know, and it has uh, management and it has uh, a way of working that is already organized, so uh, the relationships are already there. You can't suggest them because they're already already there. Do you think the results would be the same, or do you think that w there would be some differences because it's the other way around, actually? Yeah. So I think that companies actually are, don't have very strong relationship. They're kind of in the middle, right? So I think if you had a company that paid people by the hour uh, and the relationship was very much a money relationship, you work and I pay you, I pay you by the word, I pay you by the hour, I pay you by the brick, I pay you by how many books you sell, you know, it's a very specific relationship. I think that will be very hard to change. I think if you talk about knowledge workers, when people are get paid monthly and they also get to take vacation and they get to use their office to make personal calls and they are friends with the boss and they do all kinds of other things, I think those cases allow more flexibility. So I think if the workplace is incredibly rigid and um, have very hard to shift, but I think most workplaces we're interested in are kind of somewhere in the middle. They're not exactly friendly, they're not exactly money markets, they're somewhere in the middle, and I think because of that, they're actually it's possible to shift people within that. You could do it by giving people gifts. You can give it, give it, do it by giving people acknowledgments. I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah, of course, and you know, I've read a, a, po a post about it um, some time ago, um, explaining that of course, you know, a boss won't ever give you candy, but there's other things <laughs> that he can give you actually. So, uh, I think that could work in certain. Uh, circumstances, uh, as you said, because you know there's these uh, big companies that have call centers and they pay people, I don't know, ten euro per contract. So that's there's really no going away from that. Yeah, it's really hard to change. But yeah, in, in normal, so to say, companies, it, it might it might actually be a an interesting change. You know, there are so many people I've, I've talked with. That consider uh, you know the bonding games you know uh, going to have a football match with colleagues you know that kind of uh, uh, stuff uh, some companies do they just think it's ridiculous and it yeah. doesn't work do you do you think it's actually useful or it depends on how you do it so look so <clears throat> first of all I think of course it depends on how you do it but I think even for the people who think it's ridiculous it probably still works. Um, there's an old, old joke that the guys go to a, a doctor and the doctor has a shoe horse hanging on the wall uh, you know for good luck yeah and the guy said I didn't know that doctors uh, believe in shoe horses so the doctor says I don't believe in it but they tell me it works even if you don't believe in it <laughs> and, and, and yeah. I think it's like that you know there's lots of rituals, I mean we're inherently emotional creatures, we're influenced by our emotions, we're influenced by our social ties. Um, if we think about things in a purely economic perspective, uh, that doesn't describe much of the real world. Uh, think about your most uh, important relationship, which is probably your relationship with your parents, your significant other and, and your kids uh, at some point. Uh, most of these relationships are inherently irrational. Um, and in fact, if you took the Becker model and you tried to say that marriage is just about a co-production and economies of scale, you know, it will describe very little yeah. of, of romance. And, and I think 
you know, the, the people who are saying that this is ridiculous, they could also say lots of things in, in married life is ridiculous. But I think it's the things that look ridiculous from a cognitive perspective, but are emotionally useful, are actually making things work. Uh, so I, I think those things are incredibly important. You really want to care about your co-workers, about your, about your boss. I think it's important to, to have a glass of beer or wine together uh, from time to time. It's important to get silly from time to time. Uh, all of those things, uh, while you're saying, how is it relevant to my production of labor? Uh, at the end of the day, it, would be, it could be highly relevant. Um, yeah, it, 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 you know, as we said at the beginning, you should try, you know, companies should try, just try and see how it works and what uh, brings the best results. You know, I was thinking about, uh, you know, when you talked about emotions and people, I was thinking about the emotional ad campaigns that have been uh, done during the last years in a very massive way, you know, the emotional kind of, um, uh, advertising. Do you think that has in some way numbed people? You know, I, so, I think that yeah. that happened <clears throat> at some point. So, so I think I think there is some numbing, but it's also still effective. I mean, uh, you see you see a baby crying, and you can't not feel something, right? It's one of those things that it's very hard to to mute. Uh, so you could you could tell yourself it's not real, and you could learn to turn around, you could do all kinds of things, but uh, emotional cues, if you think about how emotions are structured, they come from the outside world and they evoke something in us. And we also want it, right? We go to uh, movies that make us laugh or make us sad, right? Or make us frightened. Yeah. We go to a situation that would create a certain emotion in us. That's, that's, how, we, that's how we function. Now, it could be there's too much of it, it could be we don't believe in the authenticity and so on, but, but emotion is still a very good cue and a very good uh, motivator for human behavior. So, the, this is my last question, um, which is my personal interest actually. What are you working on at the moment? <clears throat> what am I working on? So, um, so I have a, a little research center and the topics that we're mostly working on right now is, uh, we're working a little bit on healthcare, and we're interested, uh, why don't people get second opinions? Why people overeat? Why people love the word natural? Why is it the world that the moment any medication get the word natural, it becomes uh, more uh, appealing? That's one direction. The second direction is financial decision making. Uh, what can we do to help people to save for retirement? How do we get people to save for a rainy day? What are the mistakes people make when they think about money in the short term? For example, we just finished a study showing that when people have multiple loans, the loans that they pay off first are the small loans rather than the loans with the highest interest rate. Okay. Why? Because people enjoy checking off loans in the same way that we enjoy checking off emails that are not important but are bothering in our uh, mailbox. <clears throat> and that creates a very uh, financially inefficient thing. And then the third thing is we're testing dishonesty. We do lots of work on how good people can cheat a little bit and still feel good about themselves. Yeah, there's a very interesting talk on TED uh, made by you, which was really, really en enjoyable. Thank well, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. I really, I'm really looking forward to having another opportunity to chat a little bit. Any time? Really, thank you very much for your time. Sure, my pleasure. Okay, see you soon then. Goodbye. Bye.